Good morning, church. How are we all doing this morning? Okay, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet one more time, if you would. And I'm going to ask you to turn to two people. Tell them you look amazing this morning. Then tell them you look righteous this morning. Can't tell them, say, you look righteous this morning. Then I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and just put your hand on your heart. Father, thank you for this amazing church. Thank you for the glory and the presence of God that is already tangible here. What a privilege to be together as the body of Christ. Thank you for every person here under the sound of my voice. Thank you as we turn to the pages of your scripture. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is our teacher. And we ask, Holy Spirit, you'll cause Jesus to become more real to us, that you'll cause Jesus to become unveiled to us in a real dimension that'll change our lives. For our desire is to please you. Our desire is to be more like you. And I thank you that your word today will renew our minds, will strengthen our hearts and build our faith so that we can move forward in your vision and your purpose for our lives. I declare the blessing of God over every person here, over this church in Jesus name and everyone agreed said now if you love Jesus give him your big shout give him a praise in the house hallelujah amen God bless you you may be seated thank you so much for the privilege and the welcome that I've received this morning Um, I'm part of the Raymer Family Church Network. Uh, We have nearly 200 churches around South Africa and Africa. And myself and my wife uh, have the honor of being the general secretary uh, of that organization. We're also part of a, a big organization called IFCC of which you too are members, and that is a covering body that operates in this country and in Africa, uh, bringing unity to the body of Christ, uh, addressing issues in our nation, and we are busy with many things uh, in supporting, helping, and making a difference in our nation, and I know that is the heart of this church. Can you say amen? I want you to know as well that I was very, very good friends with the late Pastor Henny and Felicia. Uh, They are the founders of this church. Their children are here, their family are here, and uh, not to give my age away, but uh, I was part of the very start of your church uh, more than, I think, about 30 years ago. I can't even remember that far back. Uh, pray for me, but uh, I was just new in ministry, and uh, I was part of Ramus South under Pastor Tony and Laurel, and uh, I was part of uh, helping and joining together. Pastor Henry and I were good friends. We mentored each other. We prayed for each other. We helped each other through the good times and through the bad, and uh, it's such a privilege to be standing here again and just to be able to minister the word and stand on the shoulders of great heroes that uh, preached the word, that built with integrity, that had accountability. How many you know those are all things that we need in our world and in our nation today? Can you say amen? And so uh, I honor the leadership, Pastor Lambert and your team and all the leaders here today. I honor you and respect you and appreciate the privilege today to just share the word of God with you. I also want to just say that um, our chairman, Pastor Bert and Shonae Pretorius, they pastor the 3C Church in Centurion. Uh, they send their love and greetings today and want you to know that we are all praying for you. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11? And we're going to turn to the Word of God this morning. And how you know the Word of God is always powerful, it is always true, and that's the only thing we can build our lives on. Can you say amen? And so here, I want to read from verse 11, and if you don't mind, I'm going to read it from the Passion Translation. It just brings out an element that I want us to focus on this morning. It says, Sarah's faith embraced God's miracle power to conceive even though she was barren and past the age of childbearing. How many you know faith goes beyond what you see? Amen. So it says that her miracle, the miracle power of God was what Sarah embraced by faith, although she was past the age of childbearing, for the authority of her faith rested in the one who made the promise and she tapped into his faithfulness. Amen. So our faith is not in ourselves. Our faith is not in our church, our faith is in God and in his word. 
Amen? And we draw from His authority, and that gives us the strength to build our lives, to build the church, to build our nation. I want to talk to you this morning about the courage to recover everything. Amen? The courage to recover everything. Because how many of you know today, we, I'm sure you'll agree with me, we're living in a world, in a nation, where people want the benefit without the responsibility. Can I have, am I, am I in the right church this morning? People want the perks without the accountability. Very quiet in this church this morning. Maybe it's cold. Excuse me with all my, my jackets and my scarves. I come from the south coast. Uh, when it's really cold, we wear long pants. You know what I mean? Many of us today in this world want to enjoy the victory, but we don't want the sweat and the struggle that it often takes to enjoy the victory. And so I want to remind us today that while our salvation is free, and so are its benefits, how many you know you and I could never do anything to deserve or to earn or to pay for the incredible salvation we enjoy? But just because it's free doesn't make it cheap. It costs God everything. Amen? Jesus paid the price, the ultimate price. All the money in the world is not enough to purchase the salvation he bought for us. So it is free, but it's not cheap. Look at the person next to you, say there's a price. And the reality this morning is we all stand on the shoulders of our faith heroes who have gone before us and paved the way for us to follow. And we need to recognize and honor the legacy they leave while we build fresh, while we build new, we stand on their shoulders. And so I want you to turn to Hebrews 11, and it goes on in verse 32, and I'd encourage you uh, this week, go and read Hebrews chapter 11, the whole chapter. But here in verse 32, he goes on and he says, and what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith, say through faith, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, and turned the flight of their armies away from them. You see, faith means I have courage even when I'm weak. And so I want to talk to you this morning about having the courage, having the faith to recover it all, to recover everything. And I want to talk to us about some steps we can take, practical things, spiritual things, but practical things and real things that we can look at this morning. And we're going to look at a story of one of the heroes of faith, David. How many of you remember King David? The Bible says he was a man after God's heart. That doesn't mean he was perfect, but he always pursued what God wanted. Amen? And so here in 1 Samuel chapter 30, if you turn there, we're going to spend the morning there together. Uh, and I love your pastor. He just said, I've, I've got as much time as I need. So I hope your lunch isn't in the oven. We're going to be here a while. Can you say amen? I, I travel all the way from the south coast. My flight's only at 8 o'clock tonight. Are we all good? Stewards, lock the doors. <laughs> now money teasing. But here in 1 Samuel chapter 30, let's read together the first three verses. Now it happened. Say it happened. How you know we always want to know why it happened? <laughs> Didn't want to know why it happened. But it doesn't always tell us. But it says it happened. Say it happened. When David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag they attacked Ziglag and they burned it with fire. And they had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but they carried them away. Say, so carried them away. And they went their way. And so David and his men came to the city. They were living there at that time. And there it was, burned with fire. Their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Say, so taken captive. 
I firstly want you to just get a spiritual picture that this story is a prophetic declaration or picture of the church and the world. Satan comes in and how you know he takes people captive. He takes them alive and he uses them for his purpose. And the church comes along and we fight to recover it. That's a, that's a journey all of us are on. Can you say amen? As the church, that's our responsibility to win the lost and to disciple the saved. So keep that in mind. But there's also a personal story here of what happens when things go wrong. What happens when I come home and my home's burned and, and my family's been taken captive? Or I face a circumstance I never planned for. You see, the truth is David was about to have the worst day of his life. He had been out with his mighty men, fighting, winning battles, getting the spoils so his family could prosper and his life could go forward. Remember at this time, David had been anointed king, but he wasn't yet king. As a matter of fact, he went from being anointed king to running for his life. How many of you got a word of prophecy and you got a hope and you got an excited thing like God's going to do this in your life and then all hell breaks loose? <laughs> and you're like, what? David had been anointed as king. He was going places and suddenly the king who was then the current king is chasing him and trying to kill him. And he finds himself living in Ziklag, which wasn't a nice place to live. He had an army of misfits who had been kicked out of wherever they were living, and he was just trying to survive. And so he comes home, his family, his children, and the family of children of all his warriors have been taken captive. You see, Ziklag is what we know as an in-between city. It's between your promise and the fulfillment of your promise. It's the city where you are, where it feels like everything's going wrong, but you know God promised you something, but you haven't seen it yet. How many of you can relate this morning? I know I can. And I want you to know that it's somewhere between Ziklag that God does a work in you. He reminds you that he's your source. He shows you that he's your provision and he builds character in your life because he's got a great plan for you. He's got a great plan for your church. He's got a great plan for your, for your business. He's got a great plan for your family. Can you say amen? amen? You see, I want to just tell you this morning, the church is the hope of the world. And the church is the hope of South Africa. The politicians do not have the solution. If you're a politician, I love you. I'm praying for you. But how you know, you don't have the answer. Jesus is the answer. And so you and I are in the right place at the right time. Can you say amen? I just want to say this to you. Ziklag is a place you cannot avoid. Just look at the person next to you. Say, you will visit it. Okay, that wasn't very convincing. Look at the person on the other side. Say, you will visit it. I know some of you are sitting there saying, don't worry, I'm already there. <laughs> As a matter of fact, can I remind you of an incredible scripture? You probably know it, John 16, 33. Jesus, and I'll read it out the Amplified. Jesus says to his disciples, I've told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you will have tribulation. Trials, I love it in the Amplified, listen. Tribulation, trials, distress, and frustration. <laughs> How many you can relate now? But be of good cheer. Say, I'm of good cheer. Okay, that word, good cheer, it means have courage. Have faith. When you exit lag, you need faith. You need courage. You need to realize, in him I have peace, but in the world I'll face trouble. But I can be of good cheer. Why? Because he overcame it all. Amen? I've deprived the world of its power to harm you, and I've already conquered it. In the Passion Translation, it says, in this unbelieving world, you would experience many troubles and sorrows, but you must still be courageous. 
Say this with me. Say, I'm courageous. In the message translation, it says this. When you trust me, you will be unshakable and you'll be assured by the deep peace you experience in the midst of your trouble. So even in the most horrible circumstance, sometimes actually designed by the enemy to destroy you, God will use it to develop you. God will use it to raise you up. God will use it to bring your next miracle, your next breakthrough, your next great increase, your next wave of anointing, your next wave of breakthrough. Look at the person next to you say, you better get ready. God is with you. God is on your side. You're not going under. You're going over in Jesus' name. Come on, can someone give Jesus praise in the house? So what I want to do this morning, I want you to go on this journey with me. Let's see what David did. How did David get through this from being at a place of absolute brokenness to a being in a place where God empowered him to recover everything? Are you with me this morning? All right, let's have a look at these steps. Number one, you can write this down. David wept. David wept. Let's have a look at verse four and five. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and they wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's wives and his children had been taken captive. Look at the person next to you say, David wept. And I know this doesn't sound that spiritual. I know this doesn't sound that faithful, but I just want to say to you today that it's okay to cry. It's okay to weep when things go wrong because how many of you know we live in a real world, we've got real emotions and I want you to know sometimes things just get the better of us and we just need to cry. You don't have to do it now, but I'm just saying it's okay. <laughs> now, let me just paint this picture. The guys who were David's army were not weaklings. These guys were killers. These guys were warriors. These guys made look, today's superheroes look like wimps. They were the real deal. David was a mighty warrior of war. And the Bible says they wept till they had no more strength to weep. And so I want to encourage us today, just because you're a person of faith doesn't mean you never cry, doesn't mean you're never caught in the emotion of a moment, doesn't mean you don't face the reality of brokenness in your life. And we've got to realize today, yes, we weep, but I want to encourage you this morning, you weep in faith. You weep with hope. You weep and you know that God is still on your side. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 30, verse 5, listen to this. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Notice it says, weeping may endure for the night. It's a moment, it's a season, it's in the situation. All right, but guess what? Joy is coming. Look at the person next to you say, joy is coming. <laughs> Listen, whenever we go through something, as a matter of fact, in Ephesians 6, it says that you are able to stand in the day of evil. It doesn't say the month, the year, the five years, it says a day. The enemy can come against you and it can look like he's got his sway. It can look like he's gonna win, but it's not over till God says it's over. And he always has the last say. It's like marriage. Your wife always has the last say. Just smile if you're married, say. Especially if you're a husband, you really need to nod right now, it's important. Because the next thing you say is the start of the next argument. <laughs> My wife's not here, you're not recording this, eh? <clears throat> Psalm 56, verse eight and nine. You number my wanderings, you put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know, God is for me. Let me just ask you a question. 
if God didn't want you to weep, why would he keep your tears in his bottle? Come on, church, let's just be real this morning. I know we're people of faith. I know we're people of courage, but we're also real. Amen. And we need to be honest about our feelings. We need to be honest when we're going through something. We need to be able to feel that we can relate in the moment. We cry, but we cry in faith. Amen. We don't let it get us get the better of us. Now, if you study your Bible, you'll also discover this. Weeping in the Bible represents many things. And so there's a spiritual dimension to crying that's important for us to understand. Yes, sometimes we just cry because of the sorrow, the grief, and the sadness of the moment. But I want you to know in the Bible, if you study, you'll find crying is also an expression of faith of you crying out to God. Of you saying, God, I'm in a moment, I'm struggling, I don't know what to do, but I'm reaching out to you. I'm crying out to you for help. Lord, I understand that I'm weak, but you're strong. Crying in the Bible also represents prayer and intercession. Amen? And so we can turn our tears into prayer. And I want you to know Romans 8 verse 26, I'm sure you know it very well. It says, likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be added. You know, and he goes on, Paul, in verse 28, and he says, for all things, say all things, work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose, to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Now, how many know we love to quote verse 28? All things will work together for good. But Paul was talking in context to if you're praying, if you're interceding, if you're cooperating with the Holy Spirit in your life, then all things will work together for your good. Listen, my friend, if you're on the other side of that, sorry to be honest with you, things might not work out. Can I just pass to you for a moment? You can't take one scripture out of context and let it say what you want to say. You need to read it in context of what the story is telling within context of the scripture. And Paul was talking about when you pray, when you intercede, when you acknowledge to God you don't know what to do and you call on the Holy Spirit and you allow the Holy Spirit to work with you and in you and you cooperate with the word of God and the will of God, then all things will work together for good. Why? Because then you love him and you want his purpose. And how you know the truth is his purpose is not always my purpose. I've thought thought some things were his purpose and I discovered they weren't and I too surrender and yield to that. That's why accountability is good and important. Can you say amen? No one this morning is a lone ranger. Look at the person next to you, say you're not a lone ranger. As a matter of fact, look at the person on the other side, say you actually need help. And we never get to the place where we outgrow that. Can I be real with you this morning? I don't follow anyone until I find out who they're following. Who's your mentor? Who are you accountable to? Who's speaking into your life? Amen? Then you can do what Paul said. Follow me as I follow Christ. If I'm not following Christ, run a mile. (laughs) amen are you glad you came to church this morning hallelujah God is so good God is so good so I just want to quickly touch on the scripture it says we don't know what to pray for as we ought you know sometimes we think we do know what to pray (laughs) but the truth is we never do it's the Holy Spirit who helps us to know what to pray and if you study that word in the Greek it's quite beautiful It actually, the Greek word means to take hold together with you. So the Holy Spirit comes, he doesn't pray for you, but he takes hold together with you against whatever it is that's coming against you. So we see that when when we cry, it can also be an expression 
of turning to God in prayer and intercession. And how you know that's very important in our lives, it's important in our church life, and it's important in the life of our nation. Look at the person next to you, say, man, you're looking so much better this morning. All right, can we move on? Number two. So number one, David wept. Number two, I want you to notice something really important. Write this down. David refused to get bitter. Now let's read what happens here. It says in verse six, David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of the people were grieved, every man for their sons and his daughters, but David strengthened himself in the Lord. In other words, as we build on point one, all the warriors that were with David got caught up in the grief, got caught up in the moment, and they, their crying turned to anger, turned to bitterness, and now they're like, it's David's fault. It's God's fault. Why did this happen to us? And so the Bible says they actually spoke of stoning David, who was their leader. But the Bible says David stopped. He stepped back. He said, okay, I've cried. I've wept. I've cried out to God. Now I'm going to stand up and I'm going to strengthen myself. You see, it's a choice we make. I love what God said to Joyce Meyer once. He said, Joyce, you can get bitter or you can get better, but you can't have both. Amen? And so when we go through stuff, and how many know we've all been there where we're like, why did this happen? Where was God? I don't understand this. And there's that crying and that, that weeping in the moment. But listen, don't take the bitterness. Stand up, forgive, work through the situation, turn your eyes to Jesus. Amen? And then you move forward. And that's exactly what David did. You see, faith refuses to get bitter, faith refuses to look at the circumstance, faith looks to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, amen, so when I've gone through things, when my first wife passed away and was, was subject to cancer and she died, I had so many questions of my faith, of, you know, where's the healer, all this stuff, and there were moments where I was like, let me just walk away from ministry, but I had to make a decision, I'm not going to get better, I didn't understand a lot of things, and I told God that, I cried, but the day came where I had to stand up and say, God, I'm going to leverage this to get better, I'm going to learn through this, my experience doesn't change what your word says, Amen. The word's got to change us. We can't adopt the word to suit us. Amen. And so we work through things and we release things to God. Have a look at Psalm 84 verses 5 to 7. It says, blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. Whose heart is set on pilgrimage. What does that mean? It simply means this, their heart is not set on what's down here, their heart is set on God, their heart is set on Jesus, their heart is set in, on eternity, amen? And so it says they are blessed, why? Because they pass through the valley of Baca. The word Baca there means bitterness, sorrow. Notice it says, what do they do? They pass through. It doesn't say they don't go there, they end up there, but they don't live there. Psalm 23 says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Notice I didn't live there. I don't make that my address. That's not my abode. I might go through there, but how do you know I'm going through? Look at the person next to you, say you're going through. <laughs> it says they go through the valley of Becca, but they make it a spring. Wow. The rain covers with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. So we see there's a beautiful picture here that we might go through the valley of Baca, but we turn it. How do we turn it? Because we turn to God. Amen? We cry out to God. We ask God to help us. We ask God to give us wisdom. And we'll see what David did in a minute. But I want you to know in Proverbs 15 verse 4, it says this. A wholesome tongue is like a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. So the key to turning your bitterness is you have to start speaking the word of God. 
You have to start declaring the word of God over that situation. You have to start declaring what the spirit of God is showing you from the word. So as you apply it, as you speak life, it starts to turn that situation around. Can you say amen? And it keeps your heart tender and soft before God. Don't let words take root. Don't let the words of bitterness take root in your life. Turn it into a tree of life. Number three, can we move on? Number three, notice what it says there in verse six. It says, David encouraged himself. And that's the third point, you see. Notice the progression. David wept. Then David resisted the bitterness. And then what did he do? He started to encourage himself. He started to say, man, this is bad. This is a terrible situation. This is horrible what I'm going through, but look at the person next to you, say but. Sometimes you've just got to get your but out of the way. You know what I'm saying, right? He turned to God and he started to encourage himself in the Lord. At that moment, his family was gone, his children were gone, his army wanted to kill him, There was no one else left, but what did he do? He encouraged himself. He encouraged himself. And you know, I bet I can tell you how he did it. He started to remind himself, man, you know, when I was looking after my dad's sheep and a bear came after the sheep, God gave me the strength to overcome. When a lion came against my dad's sheep, God gave me the strength to overcome. When I went out against David, Uh, So when I went out against Goliath and it looked like this giant was bigger than everything, it was tormenting the armies of Israel. When I went out there, I didn't overcome by might. I didn't come overcome by my strength. I overcame by the power of the name of the Lord God of Israel. And if he saved me then, he'll do it again. The same God who delivered me there will deliver me again. Guess what? He started to encourage himself in the Lord. He started to remind himself who his God was. He started to remind himself that God brought him to this place and that God never lets us down. How you know God is always for you? Why? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can you say amen? Look at the person next to you. Say, you're going forward. You're moving forward with the vision that God has for your life. So David strengthened himself in the Lord. Everyone else at that moment was consumed by grief. But David stopped himself And he began to remind himself of who God was. He reminded himself of what God can do. He reminded himself that he had a history with God. And that God had never let him down. That God had always come through for him. And so he turned his heart towards God. And in that moment, he started to let courage and faith rise up. In the midst of the battle. In the midst of the circumstance. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Amen. And so we see that even Jesus rebuked the disciples for their unbelief. They had just seen some of the most incredible miracles. You know, the story in Mark, remember when, when they had um, multiplied the food, where Jesus multiplied the loaves and the bread and they fed 5,000 men? They just witnessed that miracle and then they got in the boat to go to the other side. Do you remember that? And a storm came and Jesus was sleeping on the boat. And they woke him up and they said, Jesus, save us. And then he rebuked the storm. And then he said to them, why are you of little faith? Why did you doubt? (laughs) In other words, he was implying, why did you wake me up and spoil my sleep? You should have just dealt with the storm. You've just seen the most incredible miracle. You've seen what my God can do. You've seen the power of, of his word working. Why didn't you just rise up with courage and deal with it? Look at the person next to you. Say you have the faith. Come on, say you have the courage. And so we've got to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Many, many years ago, was in about 2008, 2009, as a church, we were still new. We'd only been going three or four years. And we had a little bit of a situation in our church where a group of people had risen up and they, they were basically saying we weren't doing the right thing and a whole lot of stuff went on. And I was feeling really discouraged. And I, I came up to Joburg to be at a conference with my pastors. And uh, one of the lady intercessors came up to me and she said, uh, the Lord's given me a word for you. And I was so excited. I thought, you know, she was going to prophesy this big breakthrough and, you know, God's going to come through. And she just gave me a scripture. She said, 1 Peter 5 verse 10. That's for you. 
And I went and read it. It's, it's a beautiful scripture, actually. It says, withstand him, be firm in your faith, be immovable, knowing that the same sufferings are appointed to all the brothers in Christ. But know this, God himself will come through and establish you and ground you and strengthen you and settle you. And then she said this to me, Larry, you know you're doing the right thing. You know you're in the right place. Keep going forward. In the natural, it looks terrible, but in the spiritual, everything is right. God is working. God is moving. Keep speaking life. Amen. That one word from 2008 has helped me fight so many battles. Amen. Every time I've gone through something, I go back to that scripture and I remind myself, God placed you here. God told you to do this. God is with you, not against you. God is for you. And what happens? When faith arrives, courage arises, and you're able to stand against with intention and boldness, whatever it is that's coming against you. Amen. Number four. Number four. So number one, David wept. Number two, he resisted the bitterness. Number three, he encouraged himself in the Lord. Number four, he got a word from the Lord. Very important. He got a word from the Lord. Have a look at verse 7 and 8. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, bring me the ephod. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. And so David inquired of the Lord. And he said to the Lord, shall I pursue this troop? And God said, uh, sorry, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And God answered him and said, pursue for you will surely overtake them and without fail, you will recover everything. Look at the person next to you, say recover everything. So number four, and this is so important, when you're going through something, you need to get before God and get a word from God. Can you say amen? Get a promise, get a scripture, get a confirmation, get a guideline from the Spirit of God, and then you stand because that's how you fight your battle. Can you say amen? You see, there's two kinds of words for the word or for the Bible. You've got the Logos word, which is the written word. Amen? And it's important because we base our foundation and our lives on the written word. But then there's another word for the word Bible. It's the rhema word. And the rhema word is what we call a living word. It's an in-season word. It's a word that God takes from a scripture and he makes it alive in your spirit. It comes alive in you and it's God speaking to you about your situation and what you need to do in your circumstance. And that word becomes a living word in you. It becomes alive in you. And that's the word that carries the power. That's the word that you can act on because it's God's confirmation and direction in your life what you need to do. Amen. And so David didn't just go out and say, okay, we're going to go after this army. We're going to get our families. We're going to get all this force. No, no. What did he do first? The Bible says he inquired of the Lord. He went to God and he said, God, what do I need to do in this situation? Must I chase after them? And if you follow David's life, you'll see he learned this lesson in this moment. And from that day on, you'll see whenever he went to battle, whenever he faced something, he always went and inquired of the Lord. What do I do? Lord, how do I deal with this? And you know, James 1 says this in verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of the Father who gives liberally and without fault finding, and he will give it to you liberally. And then the next verse says one thing, don't doubt. Amen. God is for you and he'll give you the wisdom in the moment. When things are going wrong, don't run from God, run to him. Amen. God is not mad at you, he's mad about you. Amen. And you can run to him even when you've messed up. Even if you've made a wrong decision, you run to God. You say, Lord, I didn't do this right. I made a mistake. I made a wrong decision. Then you go to those in your life and you admit that to them. And then you say, God, give me wisdom now. Show me how I can move out of the situation. Show me how I can grow from the situation. Can you say amen? And then you'll be sure that you go from strength to strength. I think it's really important to notice here that there are steps that David took. I don't think he would have got to where he had the courage to seek God and to get a word from God if he didn't first encourage himself. Amen? If he didn't choose to leave the bitterness of the situation and the circumstance 
And if he didn't first cry out to God, he never would have got to this place where you could actually say, okay, God, I need you to speak to me now. I need to have clarity of mind and heart on what is my path. What is the choice I need to make here? What is the decision? And when you hear from God, it gives you the boldness and the courage to move forward and not be deterred by the things going on around you. There'll still be storms. There'll still be voices. The enemy will still try and speak lies to you, but you know you've heard from God. You stand firm. How many know Romans 10 verse 15 says, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful, say beautiful, are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. You see, when you hear the word of God, you hear faith. When you hear the word of God, it builds your spirit. When you hear the word of God, you start to get a vision of your victory. You start to get a vision of where God's going to take you. Can you say amen? And when you have that vision, you can stand assured that God is able to make it come to pass. But notice something, it says, how beautiful are the feet. Just point at my feet, say, look at those beautiful feet. Only one of you. Okay, that's fine, I'll take my shoes off and then we'll see. The guys in the front row are getting really nervous, like, no, please don't. <laughs> How old are your socks? And I'm just thinking, have they got holes in or not? <laughs> no, but it says, How beautiful are the feet of him who brings good news, who preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? How many know Jesus is the Lord of the church? Amen. Jesus is our hero. He's the one and only. Can you say amen? He's the one we worship. He's the one we look to. Hallelujah. Come on, will someone just give the Lord praise in the house this morning? And that's why it's important that you are in a faith-based Bible-believing, devil-stomping church that preaches the uncompromised word of God. Can you say amen? Because it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that builds our faith. Amen? That gives us the courage and the vision to know that's where we're heading with our lives. That's what we're putting our trust in, is in the word of God. Can you say amen this morning? And when we know that, then we can keep moving forward. So that's why you've got to build up your shield of faith. Build up your faith around the word of God. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you've got to listen. Say listen. You've got to believe. Say believe. And then you've got to speak. Say speak. Come on, let's say it together. One, two, three. Listen, believe, speak. Let's say it again. Listen, believe, speak. One more time. Listen, believe, speak speak amen then you'll be moving with the word from God when we listen to Christ-centered messages the word of God comes alive and we're able to boldly declare that the word of God is for us and with us can you say amen number five you ready for number five this morning this is probably my favorite point number five David got mad <laughs> Come on, look at the person who say, David got mad. Okay, let's put some expression to it. Say, David got mad. Come on, look at the person, especially if it's your wife, he has your opportunity. Say, David got mad. Come on, I want to see you pull the face. <laughs> Listen to verse 16 and 17. And when they brought him down, there they were, spread out over the land, eating and drinking and dancing. This is the enemy. Because of all the great spoil that they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Ziklag, the land of Judah. And David attacked them from day until night, until no man escaped except 400. And David recovered everything. Say, David recovered everything. All right, listen, he recovered everything. He recovered his wives and the children and he took all the spoils and he took all the wealth and he took all the resources and it says he fought them from day until night. Look at the person next to you say, David got mad. 
And I wanna just encourage you this morning. Sometimes it's okay to just get angry. Let me explain. You get angry at the right thing. David never got mad at God. He said, I'll pass that opportunity. God's a bit bigger than me. He didn't get mad at his warriors who wanted, wanted to kill them, kill him, and he could have. How many of you know he, was, he would have been validated to be a bit upset with them? Yeah, I've led you all my life, and now you want to kill me. But he didn't get mad at them. Who did he get mad at? He got mad at the enemy. He got mad at the enemy for taking his wife and his children and all these things. And the Bible says God gave him the permission and he went after them and he recovered everything. Look at the person next to you say, it's time to get mad. And we get mad at the devil and we rise up in faith and we say we will not stand by while you steal our family and our children and our finances and our nation. We will rise as the church. We will pray. We will fight the good fight of faith. We will speak the word of God. We will win the lost. We will do the work and we'll build the church of Jesus Christ in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? My biggest victories have come out of my worst moments. When I thought I was down and out and I'll never get through it. But you know what happened? I cried. I refused to get better. I encouraged myself. I said, it's okay, Larry, you're going to get through this. Then I went to the Lord. I said, God, you need to help me. I don't know what I'm going to do. And then you know what? I stood up with boldness and courage. I got mad at the devil. I got mad at myself for being complacent. And I said, from this day forward, I'm marching forward with the call of God. I'm marching forward with the vision God's given me. I'm marching forward with everything I know to do in the name of Jesus. And I will not quit. I will not give up. I will not let go until I finish my race, until I accomplish the purpose that God called me for and so sometimes we've got to arise with a perseverance and a determination we don't get angry at people we don't get angry at, 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 at a person for doing something we get angry at the situation we get angry at the spirit behind it Ephesians 6 says we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against the principalities and the powers and the rulers and the wickedness of darkness and we arise and we stand firm with the armor of God can you say amen and we fight our battles we put up our shield of faith we take the sword of the spirit and we refuse to quit when we know we've got a word from God. Can you say amen? Look at the person next. Yeah, come on, give the Lord praise in the house this morning. Look at the person next to you and say, I refuse to give up on the vision, on the goal that God put in our hearts for this church, for our lives, for our family, and for our nation. Can you say amen? We rise up with righteous indignation, with a righteous fire, and we say, man, we will not stand by. Acts 4, verse 18 to 20, you probably know it well. The, the apostles had been called in and threatened to not preach the gospel, been threatened to back off from preaching the good news. And look what happens in verse 18. So they called him and commanded them, do not speak nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said, whether it is right in our sight, of, in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things that we've heard and that we've seen. They were like, beat us, do what you like. We serve God. Amen. We believe in God. We walk in righteousness and we refuse to stop doing what we know God has shown us to do. How many remember the, the three Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? There they were before the king. And he said, listen, you bow and you worship this idol. And they said, we will not worship that idol. And so he heated the fiery furnace even 10 times hotter than it was ever heated. And then they made this statement. They said, King Nebuchadnezzar, know today that the God we serve will deliver us. I love this. But just know this. If he doesn't, know this. We will not bow our knee to worship any other God. 
<laughs> I mean, that's having a bit of righteous fire. It's like, listen, you throw us in there, we believe God will deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we know who we are. We know what we believe. We know where we're going. Can you say amen? And we'll burn. That's fine. But how many of you know? Hallelujah. How many you know? When you get in the fiery furnace, the fourth man always shows up in your life. His name is Jesus. His name is the King of Kings. His name is the Lord of Righteousness. He's the name that is above every name. And I want you to know at that name, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that He is the Lord of all. Amen. That's the God we serve. Hallelujah. Finally, number six. This is my other favorite point. Actually, I like all six, but who's choosing? Number six is this, and maybe this might not be my favorite. I like the getting mad part. But this is the most important. David gave God the honor for his victory. And that's so important. You know, we're living in a world today where People want to take the glory for themselves. People want ego to be lifted up. People want, you know, themselves to be looked at as the champion or whatever. But I want you to know there's only one champion. His name is Jesus. The rest of us are just people in the army trying to be like him. Can you say amen? Sometimes we do well and sometimes we don't do so well, but it's always his mercy. It's always his grace. It's always his faithfulness. It's always, always how much he loves us. That gets us through. Can you say amen? And so let me just paint you this little story. And this is so important. David refused to get better, but he also refused to allow strife and contention amongst his army soldiers. And look what happens. We, we might not have time to read all of it. The Bible says in verse 10, David pursued, he and the 400 men, and there were 200 who stayed behind because they were too weary. They could not cross the brook. All right, so what happens is, let me just explain quickly. David had 600 warriors, all right, that went with him to recover everything. When they got to this river that they had to cross, 200 of them were too weak. They didn't have the strength. So David said, it's fine. You stay here with the rest of our livestock, and we'll go with the 400, and we'll go win the battle. Notice he wasn't worried about the numbers because he knew God gave him a word. As a matter of fact, he could have left 500 and gone with 100, he still would have won. Because <laughs> when you've got a word from God, you are the majority. <laughs> Amen? Anyway, so he crosses with the 400, they win the battle. You can go read, read the story for yourself when you've got the time. So they go, they win the battle, and listen, on the way back now, they've recovered all the children, all the wives, and all the spoil. They come to David and they say to David, listen, We'll give the 200 that stayed behind, we'll give them their wives and their children, that's fine. But we're not sharing the spoil with them because they weren't there to fight the battle. And David says, there's no ways that's happening. He refuses the strife and the contention. He says, listen, we all won this battle together because listen, this battle was not yours or mine, it was God's. God gave us the victory. So none of us have the right to claim the spoils. So he went back and he made them share everything equally between all 600 men. And in that, he gave honor the, all the glory and the honor to God for the victory because he realized without God, he would have been finished. Amen. And how many you know that's us every day? I don't know about you, but every day we need God. Amen. We need the word. We need Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. And we need each other to help us to stay where we need to be so that we can serve God. And therefore, when we have victories, we don't claim that we were so great. We claim he's great. He's faithful. And you know what? You take your victories and this is how you share them. You bring your tithe to your church. You give out of your finances. You help other people. You share what God did in your life so he can do it in their life. And you become a testimony. You become a witness. Can you say amen? And you purpose to be a great warrior that will help other people get where you got. That's how you give God honor. Amen. That's how you give God the glory is you join the army and you become part of the solution and not part of the problem. Can you say amen? Look at the person next to you. Say you're going to recover everything.